Good evening and welcome back to Booked for the Night. I'm your narrator, Melissa Phillips. Tonight I'm reading chapters 9 through 11 of Tuck Everlasting by Natalie Babbitt. Enjoy. Chapter 9 The August sun rolled up, hung at mid-heaven for a blinding hour, and at last wheeled westward before the journey was done. But Winnie was exhausted long before that. Miles carried her some of the way. The tops of her cheeks were bright pink with sunburn, her nose a vivid comic red, but she had been rescued from a more serious broiling by May, who had finally insisted that she wear the blue straw hat. It came down far over her ears and gave her a clownish appearance, but the shade from its brim was so welcome that Winnie put vanity aside and dozed gratefully in Miles's strong arms, her own arms wound around his neck. The pastures, fields, and scrubby groves they crossed were vigorous with bees, and crickets leapt before them as if each step released a spring and fl flung them up like pebbles. But everything else was motionless, dry as a biscuit, on the brink of burning, hoarding final reservoirs of sap, trying to hold out till the rain returned, and Queen Anne's lace lay dusty on the surface of the meadows like foam on a painted sea. It was amazing, then, to climb a long hill, to see ahead another hill, and beyond that the deep green of a scattered pine forest, and as you climbed to feel the air ease and soften. Winnie revived, sniffing, and was able to ride the horse again, perched behind May, and to her oft-repeated question, Are we almost there? The welcome answer came at last. Only a few more minutes now. A wide stand of dark pines rose up, loomed nearer, and suddenly Jesse was crying. We're home! This is it, Winnie Foster! And he and Miles raced on and disappeared among the trees. The horse followed, turning onto a rutted path lumpy with roots, and it was as if they, f and it was as if they had slipped in under a giant colander. The late sun's brilliance could penetrate only in scattered glimmers, and everything was silent and untouched, the ground muffled with moss and sliding needles, the graceful arms of the pine stretched out protectively in every direction, and it was cool, blessedly cool and green. The horse picked his way carefully, and then ahead the path dropped down a steep embankment, and beyond that, Winnie, peering around May's bulk, saw a flash of color and a dazzling sparkle. Down the embankment they swayed, and there it was, a plain, homely little house, barn red, and below it the last of the sun flashing on the wrinkled surface of a tiny lake. Oh, look, said Winnie, water! At the same time, they heard two enormous splashes, two voices roaring with pleasure. It don't take them more than a minute to pile into that pond, said May, beaming. Well, you can't blame them in heat like this. You can go on in, too, if you want. Then they were at the door of the little house, and Tuck was standing there. "'Where's the child?' he demanded, for Winnie had hidden be behind his wife. "'The boys say you brung along a real honest-to-goodness natural child.' "'So I did,' said May, sliding down off the horse. "'And here she is.' Winnie's shyness returned at once when she saw the big man with his sad face and baggy trousers. But as he gazed at her, the warm, pleasing feeling spread through her again. For Tuck's head tilted to one side, his eyes went soft, and the gentlest smile in the world displaced the melancholy creases of his cheeks. He reached up to lift her from the horse's back, and he said, There's just no words to tell you how happy I am to see you. It's the finest thing that's happened in, he interrupted himself, setting Winnie on the ground and turned to May. Does she know? Of course she knows, said May. That's why I brung her back. Winnie, here's my husband, Angus Tuck. Tuck, meet Winnie Foster. How do, Winnie Foster, said Tuck, shaking Winnie's hand rather solemnly. Well then, he straightened and peered down at her, and Winnie, looking back into his face, saw an expression there that made her feel like an unexpected present, wrapped in pretty paper and tied with ribbons, in spite of May's blue hat, which still enveloped her head. Well then, Tuck repeated, seeing you know... I'll go on and say this is the finest thing that's happened in, oh, at least 80 years. Chapter 10 Winnie had grown up with order. She was used to it. Under the pitiless double assaults of her mother and grandmother, the cottage where she lived was always squeaking clean, mopped and swept and scoured into limp submission. 
There was no room for carelessness, no putting things off until later. The foster women had made a fortress out of duty. Within it, they were indomitable, and Winnie was in training. So she was unprepared for the homely little house beside the pond, unprepared for the gentle eddies of dust, the silver cobwebs, the mouse who lived, and welcome to him, in a table drawer. There were only three rooms. The kitchen came first, with an open cabinet where dishes were stacked in perilous towers, without the least regard for their varying dimensions. There was an enormous black stove and a metal sink, and every surface, every wall, was piled and strewn and hung with everything imaginable, from onions to lanterns to wooden spoons to wash tubs, and in a corner stood Tuck's forgotten shotgun. The parlor came next, where the furniture, loose and sloping with age, was set about helter-skelter. An ancient green plush sofa lolled alone in the center, like yet another mossy fallen log facing a soot-streaked fireplace still deep in last winter's ashes. The table with a drawer that housed the mouse was pushed off, also alone, into a far corner, and three armchairs and an elderly rocker stood about aimlessly, like strangers at a party, ignoring each other. Beyond this was the bedroom, where a vast and tipsy brass bed took up most of the space, but there was room beside it for the washstand with the lonely mirror, and opposite its foot a cavernous oak wardrobe from which leaked the faint smell of camphor. Up a steep flight of narrow stairs was a dusty loft. That's where the boys sleep when they're home, May explained, and that was all. And yet it was not quite all, for there was everywhere evidence of their activities, May's and Tuck's. Her sewing, patches and scraps of bright cloth, half-completed quilts and braided rugs, a bag of cotton batting with wisps of its contents like snow, drifting into cracks and corners. The arms of the sofa webbed with strands of thread and dangerous with needles. His wood carving, curly shavings furring the floor, and little heaps of splinters and chips, every surface dim with the sawdust of countless sandings, limbs of unassembled dolls and wooden soldiers, a ship model propped on the mouse's table waiting for its glue to dry, and a stack of wooden bowls, their sides smooth to velvet, the topmost bowl filled with a jumble of big wooden spoons and forks, like dry, bleached bones. We make things to sell, said May, surveying the mess approvingly. And still this was not all, for on the old beam ceiling of the parlor, streaks of light swam and danced and wavered like a bright mirage, reflected through the windows from the sunlit surface of the pond. There were bowls of daisies everywhere, gay, white, and yellow, and over everything was the clean, sweet smell of the water and its weeds, the chatter of a swooping kingfisher, the carol and trill of a dozen other kinds of bird, and occasionally the thrilling bass note, bass note of an unastonished bullfrog at ease somewhere along the muddy banks. Into it all came Winnie, eyes wide and very much amazed. It was a whole new idea to her that people could live in such disarray, but at the same time she was charmed. It was comfortable. Climbing behind May up the stairs to see the loft, she thought to herself, maybe it's because they think they have forever to clean it up. And this was followed by another thought, far more revolutionary. Maybe they just don't care. The boys don't be home very much, said May, as they came up into the half light of the loft. But when they are, they bed up here. There's plenty of room. The loft was cluttered, too, with all kinds of odds and ends, but there were two mattresses rolled out onto the floor, and fresh sheets and blankets were folded almost neatly on each, waiting to be spread. "'Where do they go when they're away?' asked Winnie. "'What do they do?' "'Oh,' said May, "'they go to different places, do different things. They work at what jobs they can get, try to bring home some of their money. Miles can do carpeting, and he's a pretty fair blacksmith, too.' Jesse now, he don't ever seem too settled in himself. Course, he's young. She stopped and smiled. That sounds funny, don't it? Still, it's true, just the same. So, Jesse, he does what strikes him at the moment, working in the fields or in saloons, things like that, whatever he comes across. But they can't stay on in any one place for long, you know. None of us can. People get to wondering, she sighed. We've been in this house about as long as we dare, going on 20 years. It's a right nice place. Tuck's got so as he's reached attached to it. Then, too, it's off by itself. Plenty of fish in the pond, not too far from the towns around. 
When we need things, we go sometimes to one, sometimes the next, so people don't come to notice us much. And we sell where we can. But I guess we'll be moving on one of these days. It's just about time. It sounded rather sad to Winnie, never to belong anywhere. That's too bad, she said, glancing shyly at May, always moving around and never having any friends or anything. But May shrugged off this observation. Tuck and me, we got each other, she said, and that's a lot. The boys now, they go their separate ways. They're some different, don't always get on too good, but they come home whenever the spirit moves, and every ten years, first the week of August, they meet at the spring and come home together, so we can be a family again for a little while. That's why we was there this morning. One way or another, it all works out. She folded her arms and nodded, more to herself than to Winnie. Life's got to be lived, no matter how long or short, she said calmly. You got to take what comes. We just go along like everybody else, one day at a time. Funny, we don't feel no different. Leastways, I don't. Sometimes I forget about what's happened to us. Forget it altogether. And then sometimes it comes over me and I wonder why it happened to us. We're plain as salt, us tucks. We don't deserve no blessings. If it is a blessing... And likewise, I don't see how we deserve to be cursed, if it is a curse. Still, there's no use trying to figure why things fall the way they do. Things just are, and fussing don't bring changes. Tuck now, he's got a few other ideas, but I expect he'll tell you. There, the boys are in from the pond. Winnie heard a burst of voices downstairs, and in a moment, Miles and Jesse were climbing to the loft. Here, child, said May hastily, hide your eyes. Boys, are you decent? What'd you put on to swim in? I got Winnie up here. Do you hear me? For goodness sake, Ma, said Jessie, emerging from the stairwell. You think we're going to march around in our all together with Winnie Foster in the house? And Miles behind him said, We just jumped in with our clothes on. Too hot and tired to shut them. It was true. They stood there side by side with their wet clothes plastered to their skins, little pools of water collecting at their feet. Well, said May, relieved. All right, find something dry to put on. Your pa's got supper nearly ready. And she hustled Winnie down the narrow stairs. Chapter 11 It was a good supper, flapjacks, bacon, bread, and applesauce, but they ate sitting about in the parlor instead of around a table. Winnie had never had a meal that way before, and she watched them carefully at first to see what rules there might be that she did not know about. But there seemed to be no rules. Jessie sat on the floor and used the seat of a chair for a table, but the others held their plates in their laps. There were no napkins. It was all right then to lick the maple syrup from your fingers. Winnie was never allowed to do such a thing at home, but she had always thought it would be the easiest way. And suddenly, the meal seemed luxurious. After a few minutes, however, it was clear to Winnie that there was at least one rule. As long as there was food to eat, there was no conversation. All four tucks kept their eyes and their attention on the business at hand. And in the silence, given time to think, Winnie felt her elation and her thoughtless pleasure wobble and collapse. It had been different when they were out of doors, where the world belonged to everyone and no one. Here, everything was theirs alone. Everything was done their way. Eating, she realized now, was a very personal thing, not something to do with strangers. Chewing was a personal thing. Yet, here she was, chewing with strangers in a strange place. She shivered a little and frowned, looking round at them. That story they had told her, why, they were crazy, she thought harshly, and they were criminals. They had kidnapped her right out of the middle of her very own wood, and now she would be expected to sleep all night in this dirty, peculiar house. She had never slept in any bed but her own in her life. All these thoughts flowed at once from the dark part of her mind. She put down her fork and said unsteadily, I want to go home. The tuck stopped eating and looked at her surprised. May said soothingly, Why, of course you do, child. That's only natural. I'll take you home. I promised I would, soon as we explained a bit to why you've got to promise you'll never tell about the spring. That's the only reason we brung you here. We got to make you see why. Then Miles said, cheerfully and with sudden sympathy, 
There's a pretty good old rowboat. I'll take you out for a row after supper. No, I will, said Jessie. Let me. I found her first, didn't I? Winnie Foster, listen, I'll show you where the frogs are, and... Hush, Tuck interrupted. Everyone, hush. I'll take Winnie rowing on the pond. There's a good deal to be said, and I think we better hurry up and say it. I got a feeling there ain't a whole lot of time. Jesse laughed at this and ran a hand roughly through his curls. That's funny, Pa. Seems to me like time's the only thing we got a lot of. But May frowned. You worried, Tuck? What's got you? No one saw us up on the way up. Well now, wait a bit. Yes, they did come to think of it. There was a man on the road just outside Tree Gap, but he didn't say nothing. He knows me, though, said Winnie. She had forgotten, too, about the man in the yellow suit, and now, thinking of him, she felt a surge of relief. He'll tell my father he saw me. He knows you, said May, her frown deepening. But you didn't call out to him, child. Why not? I was too scared to do anything, said Winnie, honestly. Tuck shook his head. I never thought we'd come to a place where we'd be scaring children, he said. I guess there's no way to make it up to you, Winnie, but I'm sure most awful sorry it had to happen like that. Who was this man you saw? I don't know his name, said Winnie, but he's a pretty nice man, I guess. In fact, he seems supremely nice to her now, a kind of savior. And then she added, he came to our house last night, but he didn't go inside. Well, that don't sound too serious, Pa, said Miles. Just some stranger passing by. Just the same, we got to get you home again, Winnie, said Tuck, standing up decisively. We got to get you home just as fast as we can. I got a feeling this whole thing is going to come apart like wet bread. But first we got to talk, and the pond's the best place. The pond's got answers. Come along, child. Let's go out on the water. Thanks for joining us for tonight's edition of Booked for the Night. I'll be back tomorrow night with more of Tuck Everlasting by Natalie Babbitt. Thanks for listening, and good night.